we have not done much about um, what is an evaporator um, like and what a condenser is like, we have not discussed much on that. So, today we are going to do that. Like in the basic system components, we have spent time on compressors, we have spent time on expansion devices and we are going to now look at evaporators and condensers. And then we look at condensers. So, here in this picture we can see um, 1 and 3 represent the condenser and the evaporator as a process. We see some pictures of a A shaped uh, evaporating coil, we see an expansion device and we see a condensing unit and we see a distributor. Okay, so, here we have uh, several types of heat exchangers which can work both as an evaporator or as a condenser, while there is a difference between how it functions in the evaporator and condenser, but broadly there is there is a um, applicability of the same component with different sizing in the evaporator and just as it is in the condenser. So, what we have here these are conventional fin on tube heat exchangers different sizes. These are brace plate heat exchangers and I am going to put some more detail around uh, how they function <coughs> in the uh, subsequent slides. This is a micro channel heat exchanger, it is similar to what we see in car radiators, there are a number of uh, tubes inside a flat uh, tubular section and there are fins braced uh, together between the tubes. Then we have shell and tube condensers, these are the most uh, conventional condensers have been in use for long, they are um, easy to manufacture and fairly robust, they can handle very high pressures and temperatures, but they are expensive to build. So, they have been gradually wherever the application permits, they have been replaced by lower cost alternatives like brace plate heat exchangers. <coughs> now, we look at what is a shell and tube heat exchanger. So, in a shell and tube heat exchanger, we have one refrigerant or one fluid enter and pass through a cross section of tubes and come back through another uh, bank of uh, tubes while the second fluid is passing through baffles and again is exiting the heat exchanger. So, depending on how we design it, it could be a, a two pass system or a four pass system and, and the baffles could be determined basically into how many times you are going to have the fluid come in contact with the tubes. The space between the tube sheets is in, it is enclosed. So, the key thing here is that we must be able to seal the two fluids um, apart. So, we do not want for example, water entering into the refrigerant path or vice versa as, as that is a, a risk towards performance of product. Then we have micro channel heat exchangers. Now, this is something recent like in the last 3 to 4 years, these heat exchangers have entered applications in air conditioning. A part of this has been because of refrigerant change, R410A has a lower pressure drop for a similar uh, heat load per circuit and for that reason it is possible to use the, the small channels that are there. So, 410A, 134A are all potential refrigerants where micro channel will be favorably applied because they can allow a longer uh, circuit length uh, for the same heat load. Uh, if you look at the inside of a micro channel heat exchanger, then this is what it looks like. So, we would have a header within which the refrigerant enters and then it is distributed into different channels. So, each of these strips has within it some micro channels. So, we have a tube and within the tube there are small um, openings into which we push the refrigerant using uh, the compressor pressure. And then there are some baffles and the whole idea behind the baffles is to equally distribute the refrigerant across the whole cross section of the heat exchanger. Then a replacement or an alternative for shell and tube uh, condensers is a braised plate heat exchanger. In a braised plate heat exchanger, multiple plates with grooves for refrigerant flow are stacked together, they are welded together and it makes for a very compact heat exchanger. So, 
some of the most effective heat exchangers that we will see whether it is an application in evaporator or condenser would be the brace plate heat exchanger. Uh, typically used in uh, chillers, we have water on one side and refrigerant on another, but there is nothing which prevents us from using it as a heat exchanger between two refrigerant streams as well. Now, a typical piping for a brace plate heat exchanger and uh, what we are showing here is the difference between the application in an evaporator and the application in a condenser. In an evaporator, the refrigerant enters at the bottom, leaves on top. We want to maximize the opportunity for refrigerant to um, evaporate and get the best heat transfer. And the water enters on top and leaves on the bottom and it is just reversed in the condenser. This is how a brace plate heat exchanger can be used in a refrigeration application. It can be used in an economizer, it can be used in an evaporator, condenser. Now we look at uh, evaporators and condensers more from an application perspective. So if you are looking at an evaporator for a refrigerator, what would it be like? A refrigerator is a low load um, appliance, so the cooling requirement may be 200 to 300 watts. In the in the lowest cost refrigerator, we do not use any forced convection. If you looked at your refrigerator at home, the basic one, the 165 liter which is most popular does not have any fan inside, whereas the frost free ones would have a fan inside for circulation. So there the entire process of cooling is for the refrigerator compartment where you store your food at above zero temperature is all by natural convection. So you have the evaporator on top, cold air descends, whatever heat it gains, the heat, uh, the air rises back, comes in contact with the evaporator plates and, and the process continues. Then in case of uh, frost free, we have something different. Now when we look at the uh, domestic refrigerator, Initially when these products were made and when technology was not available to make roll bond evaporators of the type that you see here, then copper tubes were used wrapped around by aluminum and that would form the evaporator. And now it, because of the costs of copper that have been rising consistently and the availability to technology where you could take two sheets of aluminum, bond them together with refrigerant paths uh, that are created by expanding that metal. So it makes for lower cost and much more effective and reliable evaporators. So this is what would be there inside uh, refrigerators that are manufactured today. The main enabler to use of uh, this kind of evaporator is that we can weld aluminum to copper and allow for an extension piece that the manufacturer can then build into the system. So it is easy to manufacture because it is coming uh, pre-fixed or pre-connected with a copper piece that gets connected to the rest of the piping. And the piping, if you remember the basic refrigeration cycle, we will need to connect one end to the suction line and another end to the capillary. And now before the suction line um, goes to the compressor, there might be an accumulator just to take care of any surge, any refrigerant that um, manages to have any droplets of uh, R134A or R12, whatever uh, fluid we are using as a refrigerant. Now when, when we are designing a refrigerator uh, evaporator, we are trying to define the flow path. So if you see there are <coughs> lines, can most of you see the lines on the roll bond evaporator? So this is actually the refrigerant path and this is how it is shipped. When it comes into the appliance uh, and it is on the line, then it gets formed. So you bend it around either into a C section or into a complete rectangular section so that uh, you form the freezer which forms the basic heat transfer um, uh, component inside the refrigerator. And there are uh, several iterations that happen before a refrigerator is cleared for maintaining the temperatures uh, that are targeted inside an appliance. So, so the playing field when you are designing a refrigerator evaporator is how you move refrigerant through these tubes. And while companies have their own proprietary software, um, most of the part has to be validated experimentally. 
So, you would get a sample, you would make your best um, uh, guess on what would be the right distribution of refrigerant and then you would run tests and those tests would enable you to recalibrate the software results if there is a software being used or else you would use your judgment to move refrigerant from one portion to another. What you are trying to do here is <coughs> the amount of frost that gets formed during the normal uh, compressor cycle needs to be minimized. So, you do not want too cold a temperature in one part of the um, evaporator and too high a temperature on another part of the refrigerator. Then we also need to develop an understanding of the natural convection that is happening in the refrigerator, which part of the refrigerator evaporator is coming in contact with warm air rising from the components, right? warm air coming in contact because of door openings. So, all that gets uh, included in making sure that these paths are um, sufficient to maintain the product temperature and comply with standards for refrigerator testing. Then if you look at a frost free refrigerator evaporator, then we have something similar to phenon tube evaporators. The only difference is that this is again all aluminum, the tubes and the fins are in aluminum. This is an accumulator. And then there is a short extension piece that will allow this to be connected to uh, copper tubes um, at the manufacturer's end. And we will have uh, some <coughs> devices which are there like a sensor which is used to monitor when defrosting cycle needs to kick in. So, so this is an example of a frost free refrigerator evaporator. And then we have a condenser coil for a refrigerator. Now, this could be in a frost free as well as in conventional depending on size. So, you will see this typically in large refrigerators say 400 liters and above. Essentially, it is a, a steel tube with the wires a spot welded on it to increase the air side heat transfer coefficient. And this particular uh, component that you see on the slide has a rating of about 100 watts minimum to 300 watts maximum. And we, we allow this range so that one component can be used uh, with several models. Then we come to air conditioners. So, in air conditioners, we will most of the time see a phenon tube evaporator in use. And before we get down to designing that, we need to include in our assessment what are the inputs available to us. So, in one of the previous lectures, I talked about uh, the requirements, like what is the cooling requirement. So, take for example, uh, we have a residential application with the <coughs> 5 kilowatt of cooling requirement. That is a design input. Using that, we would select a compressor. So, we would make an assumption of the evaporating temperature that will be used and a good starting point could be the standard condition of 7.7 .7 evaporating. At that temperature, we would select a compressor that can give us 5 kilowatt of cooling. Now, having done that, we come to the point of designing an evaporator and, and what are we going to do to design it. So, we will make an assumption because the whole set of components are interrelated and we have not done the condenser design yet. So, we will make an assumption of what kind of a condenser we are going to design. We could be designing for high efficiency or we could be designing for um, acceptable market cost, market price driven um, uh, market cost. So, if you want to do that, then we will make an assumption of a lower superheat. We know how the expansion valve performs and the expansion valve can always be selected in a way that we get the right pressure drop for the evaporator temperature that we have um, made an assumption and the condensing temperature which again we will make use of based on the ambient air temperature considerations and whether we are designing it for cost or efficiency. So, take for example, design condition 35 degrees centigrade outdoor air temperature. So, for 35 degrees outdoor air temperature, we could run the condenser at 55 or we could run it at 51. Now, if you are targeting 51, we know for ourselves that we are designing a high, highly efficient system. And then we are prepared for a condenser that will have a higher cost. So, we make that assumption. So, we will make one of the two assumptions. Let us say we make an assumption that we want to run at 55, right. And with 55, with 2 degrees uh, subcooling or 4 degrees subcooling, an assumption of that nature, we can come to 
good understanding on where we will be on this uh, pressure enthalpy diagram. So, if we know the condensing temperature, we know the condensing pressure, saturation conditions, then we have defined the subcooling between 2 and 4, let us say it is 4. So, if it is 55 and 4, the temperature of uh, refrigerant would be 51, right. Simple and we make an assumption that there are no pressure drops right now in the um, liquid line or in the evaporator. So, then the expansion device has on its um, inlet a pressure corresponding to 55 degrees uh, condensing and then here we made an assumption of 7.7 uh, .7 7 evaporating. So, corresponding to that for R22 we will have a pressure equal to 77 psi gauge and on this side it will be 300 psi gauge. So, the difference in the two would allow us to select the expansion valve for a cooling capacity of 5 kilowatt. We would put in the margins um, that we expect based on higher temperatures and lower temperatures, lower ambient air temperatures. So, we would have come to the design of an evaporator coil knowing an expansion valve that will feed it sufficiently over a certain range. Is this clear about um, making an assumption on subcooling, having a pressure and then a delta P across the expansion valve allowing us to select the expansion valve and then we being prepared to do a um, evaporator coil design. Yes, thank you. So, now that we have all this, uh, yeah before I move away from the slide, let us also keep in mind that we will be targeting a certain superheat in the evaporator. So, while this may not come as an explicit design input, we will take note of it because we want to protect the compressor. So, we said 5 kilowatt. Evaporating temperature was it 7.7 .7, he said and then we say we are designing for cost. So, we will use a condensing temperature which is a little on the higher side. So, this is enough for us to choose the expansion valve and then come to an evaporator where we would be having an entering air uh, entering refrigerant condition corresponding to 4 on this slide and we will have an entering air temperature which will be a combination of dry bulb and wet bulb which will be corresponding to the temperature we want to maintain. And if we are being uh, very precise we could add some temperature gain in the ducts. So, let us say if you are maintaining 25, it could be that there will be a 2 degree temperature rise in the ducts and we could add that. Now, this I have included in my slides because in an earlier uh, lecture I was trying to uh, demonstrate what happens uh, to the air properties. So, if you look at um, uh, where we are uh, in terms of comfort, uh, temperature of around 25 and relative humidity of 50 percent would be somewhere here and we are going to have an evaporator uh, operating at 7.7. So, there will be a combination of two processes that will happen in the evaporator. One is because of the delta T between air and the refrigerator, um, the evaporator coil sorry, the evaporator coil. So, we can assume that uh, the evaporator coil will be at uh, a certain temperature which is 7.7 .7. that will drive heat transfer that is sensible heat transfer. At the same time there is also going to happen condensation because the temperature 7.7 .7 will usually be below the dew point of uh, room air. air. So, what drives that? So, moisture condensation would be driven by a property of air which is corresponding to the moisture content which is expressed as grams per kg of dry air. So, corresponding to 25 and 50 percent which will be somewhere here, we would have a certain W 
and then we would have a certain W corresponding to 7.7 .7, which is the temperature we are assuming the evaporator coil to be at. So, this will give us the, the slope in this line will give us a combination of the latent uh, load and the sensible load and the difference between the two humidities will drive uh, the rate of condensation. Look at what are the key drivers. So, humidity difference and the difference in uh, the moisture content and temperature difference will be the driving factors for design of uh, coils and, uh, and then now what are the things that we are having uh, as a, a set of variables that we can play with. So, I have included uh, some of the things here. So, for the fin and tube, um, these are the things that we need to define for the target heat transfer and for the assumptions that we made. So, material of the fin, fin thickness, fin spacing, fin type, fin coating and then the copper uh, or aluminum tube that we are going to use or is it going to be some other material. In some special cases, we might use stainless steel and that is primarily for corrosion resistance. It could uh, typically be required in marine environments or defense applications where a higher level of robustness is preferred in favor of um, a low cost. So, so they are not really concerned about price anymore, they are concerned about reliability. Then we need to define the vertical and transverse pitch. So, to get a whole idea and a whole world around <coughs> what these um, phenon tube heat exchangers are, I will try and look at uh, some of these uh, slides. So, what you see in copper color is essentially the copper tube and what you see in gray are the fins. So, the variables that we are looking to define are a combination of the number of tubes, the OD of the tube, the vertical pitch of the tube. And uh, in an evaporator, what is going to happen is warm air is, is going to come in contact with the cold surface of the fin and the tubes and leave at a temperature which will be around 12 degrees centigrade and um, relative humidity in the region of 95 percent because there is condensation that has happened. Now, how do we maximize heat transfer? As you can see, this is a simple um, fin on tube construction where the tubes are in line. So, this tube is in the flow path. So, it is in the shadow of um, the earlier tube. So, we would see refrigerant just uh, some, of, some of the air sorry, some of the air just flow through like this while the refrigerant is flowing through all these tubes. Now, the task we have is uh, what would be the optimum combination, diameter, thickness, thickness of the fin, placement of the tubes, distance from each other so that we are able to get optimum value for what we invest in a heat exchanger. And to keep an eye on costs, what you could remember is that uh, copper being an expensive material, the copper tube or if you are even going to use aluminum tube, the length of the tube used is going to be one variable. So, when we are looking at face area, we are looking at essentially a certain dimension which is the finned area, the length of the finned area of the heat exchanger and the height which would mean the number of tubes in the path of uh, air flow. So, this would constitute the height of the coil and this dimension which would be the full length of the heat exchanger would constitute the fin length or length between tube sheets. These are two terminologies that are used. In a window air condition of example, you could have about half a meter of um, a coil width and somewhere in the region of 16 tubes vertically just for you to have a certain sense of a 5 kilowatt uh, coil and, and the pitch there is uh, vertical is 1 inch. 25.4 and the tube diameter 3 by 8. Then if we look at um, for purposes of improving heat transfer, we look at a staggered um, configuration. So, instead of tubes being right in front of each other, they are alternate and, and, and we are making sure that air comes in greater contact and there is a penalty here and the penalty here is the pressure drop. So, the air side pressure drop will go up but we will have more heat transfer. And now from these diagrams, if you want to look at a physical coil, this is what it is going to look like. Right now, it has not been fully manufactured. So, we can see the fins and then one of the tasks we have is to define the gap between the fins, whether it is going to be 2 millimeters, 5 millimeters, conventional uh, spec is to define the number of fins in 1 inch 
it is also fine to define the distance between two fins depending on what you are comfortable with. And then these uh, tubes are referred to as hairpins because they are manufactured in a way that a long tube is bent folded automatically and allows for eliminating connectors on one end of the heat exchanger. What we need to be aware of is that um, between a choice for a longer uh, heat exchanger versus a shorter one with a greater height, the hairpins will add to the refrigerant side pressure drop. So, so in making our designs, we must just keep that uh, factor in mind not to make the heat exchanger too um, small in terms of the length between tube sheets and make it too high because you would spend uh, some of the power without any gain in overcoming the pressure drop across the hairpins. Now, once we manufacture it, um, this is what it will look like. So, the other end is where the hairpins are and here we have the fins. Now, this fin spacing is much higher than what we saw in the previous slide. And that was a, a more like a mini split application whereas, this is more of a, um, a refrigerator kind of a application or a, a design which is meant for low pressure drop. So, here these parts are referred to as return bends and in the manufacturing process after um, we manufacture the coil they are brazed in an automatic process um, which uses multiple uh, guns, uh, brazing guns. And now, before, before we go forward we also need to understand how this is manufactured. So, we saw in the previous slide we could just slide in these hairpins and there would not be a, a great um, solid contact between the hairpin and the fins. So, there is a process of expansion and the or process used for expansion could be either hydraulic or there could be a bullet used. Or today most coil manufacturers make use of a bullet expansion which means there is an expander with a, uh, which goes through the entire length of the tube and expands it so that it is firmly bonded to the aluminum fins and uh, that also allows for adding strength to the heat exchanger. So, once that is done then we come to brazing the uh, return bends and after that brazing process is completed then the coil is subjected to some leak testing. <coughs> and also on a random basis at a certain frequency burst tests are done to make sure that the coil uh, integrity is uh, intact. We are not going to experience leaks or any unfamiliar um, situation during operation. So, it is not uncommon to perform a burst test once in a month or once in 15 days for a very large manufacturing facility just to make sure that none of the variables have gone to a point where uh, there is a weak uh, tube anywhere. And uh, to develop an appreciation of where those weaknesses come up, one is when we are bending this uh, hairpin and there is a, a process used where you could thin the outer part of this hairpin and that wall thickness reduction could lead to a compromise on the strength that it can withstand. So, if we are using it in condensers we would like to make sure that uh, this does not lead to a burst or a hairpin leak and a consequent loss of performance. Then when we are expanding again there is um, finally, it is a machine it depends on how reliable and repetitive it is and how well it is maintained the bullets could cause. Um, uneven expansion and, and to prevent against that again. So, this becomes like a consolidated test which will point out that yeah everything is going fine no need to worry keep producing or if we have a failure then we know we need to revisit and adjust parameters. So, that um, the coil meets the spec. Now, I want to add to the earlier discussion about the design inputs that we will also have some requirements in the evaporator for uh, managing condensate. So, if you are going to condense moisture we will need to find a way to drain it. At the same time we also want to make sure that while we are uh, condensing moisture we are not carrying it through into the supply air into the occupied space. So, one thing we address by design. So, if we were to keep the phase velocity on the coil in the region of 2.5 meters per second we can be sure that there will be no condensate carryover. And then the angle at which the coil is positioned also determines how well the condensate flows into the drain pan and then we will have to design a drain pan and in certain units which are uh, uh, a cassette type of units which are installed in the ceiling it becomes a challenge to drain the condensate and therefore, pumps are typically put in. So, there is a condensate drain pump which is uh, coupled to a sensor and it would ensure that all uh, moisture is uh, thrown out into a drain. <coughs> 
Then um, while we are looking at coils, we will eventually also need to look at uh, designing the fan to overcome the pressure drop, the air side pressure drop in the coil and also address delivering the required air flow in the occupied space. So that needs to be done, right? We, when we look at a split, we have a certain air flow. We, when we look at a window air conditioner or a chiller or an air handling unit, we would need to uh, deliver that. So it gets included in the design of the air conditioner, not necessarily the evaporator coil. But they are interrelated and for that reason we must keep that in mind. Then in some cases, um, we may want to put in a sensor and that is to protect the compressor or to warn the user if there is any abnormal condition that has come up. What, do, what are the abnormal conditions that will come up? If we have a customer, a user using an air conditioner without cleaning the filter, there will come a time when airflow will reduce to maybe 30 percent of what it was designed for or it may even get blocked totally. While the compressor continues, the temperature <coughs> in the evaporator will begin to drop because there is nothing to add heat to the refrigerant and in that process it could reach freezing temperatures. So if that were to happen and if we put in a sensor that detects that, it could alert the user, call for service or um, just clean the filter or whatever that can happen. Another case that happens is that if you have a, a leak in the refrigerant uh, circuit, a minor leak over a period of time, it could lead to a drop in uh, evaporating temperatures and since it is minor, the compressor would continue to run and uh, run at low evaporating temperatures causing uh, build up of ice. And again, if we put in a sensor there, so that would be helpful. Now, putting in a sensor also means adding cost and complexity because then we need to have a controller. We need to have a controller that will trigger a relay. We need to have an LED or a display device that tells us that yes, something is wrong. This, this needs to be attended. So when systems go larger in size, it makes sense to put in all these uh, controls and um, benefit from the convenience of diagnosing any faults that show up. Then we looked at uh, the hairpins. We also need to define how many circuits. Now, when I say circuits, that means how many parallel refrigerant paths we can uh, put in a coil. So for a tube diameter of, uh, let us say, old time one uh, half inch of uh, uh, diameter, which is not in use in smaller systems anymore, we would go to 16,000 BTU per hour, which would be about a 1.3 uh, tons or converting it into say about 8 kilowatts, you could go to 6 to 8 kilowatts per circuit. With 3 by 8, it is fine to go to 0.75 tons per circuit or uh, say about 2.7 kilowatt per circuit. Now these are thumb rules, these are based on experience and they help start with the design which will come to convergence earlier if you are going to use a program or it will give us a desired result much better, much quicker with fewer investment in prototyping and uh, alternative designs. So what else um, do we need to consider when we are looking at uh, circuiting is the pressure drop. So there is a pressure drop in the evaporator and we want to have the right trade off between pressure drop leading to a drop in performance of the compressor and the benefit we have in terms of a higher heat transfer. So these are the two variables that uh, if, we, if we get into details of uh, opt developing an optimizing program then we will manage these two together. And then internal surface advancements of tubes would be justified. So just like we can increase the air side heat transfer coefficient using uh, fins, we could increase the heat transfer coefficient inside the tube using enhanced geometries. And I am going to show you some pictures uh, how that is done. But that means we can again for the same size of the heat exchanger deliver more heat transfer. Variables. So these are the variables that we have in our hand when we are going to target delivering uh, 5 kilowatt of uh, cooling using an evaporator. So another uh, added point is if we are targeting a high EER, we would be willing to invest more in the evaporator and then we would uh, select a design with a higher evaporating temperature. Or another point would be if you are looking at uh, cooling some equipment where there is hardly any latent load. So let us say a computer room cooling or telecom uh, equipment cooling in shelters. So then the sensible heat factor is as high as 0 0.9. So in those scenarios, it does not make sense to keep the refrigerant temperature 
in the 7.7 .7 region. We would bring it more towards 10 degrees centigrade, allowing us to benefit from a higher energy efficiency ratio and eliminating uh, investment in latent uh, removal of latent load, which is not there. This we have covered. Another part we would need look to look at is the air distribution over the coil face. So, when we are designing uh, the airflow path, air is going to enter the air conditioner um, through some opening and then there is a blower that is going to draw air over the coil. So, we need to space them in a way that there is a uniform air distribution. When I say uniform, it is an ideal, it never really happens in real life. But we try to maximize um, the evenness and the rest of it would be taken care of by circuiting. So, if you look at a <coughs> evaporator, <coughs> these two ends, the top and the bottom would usually be starved of air because of insulation, because of the way it is manufactured, there might be a cover, there may be some part of the drain pan. So, one of the ways when you look at circuiting is to add additional tubes in the top and the bottom circuit and equalize the circuiting in the rest of it and then make an assumption that yeah, air flow in, in, in the center of this uh, heat exchanger is going to be even. And then we also need to keep in mind whether it is an air conditioner or a refrigerator, we need to have a controller that senses the temperature of air and modulates the compressor. So, it could be as simple as a relay that is switched on and off or it could be as complex as a variable speed compressor that is modulating and speed adjusting itself to the changes in uh, demand, uh, cooling demand. <coughs> now, when we look at um, a controller, we look at a user interface and it needs to have an ability to switch the unit on and off. We need to have means of regulating fan speed. We need to have some means of adjusting the temperature. And then we could look at some special features. So, there are manufacturers who would um, deliver a unit with a special feature like turbo cooling. You enter a room, you want quick cooling, you switch that uh, mode and the fan run at its highest speed. If it is a variable speed compressor, it will run at the highest speed and give you, um, you know, quick cooling. And then you could also have a, a feature which is like um, a feature that reduces the cooling at night when you are sleeping because the metabolic level comes down. So, you could make an estimate, you could put in an algorithm which is a timer based algorithm. So, after 2 hours you raise the temperature by 0.5, after another 2 hours you raise it by another 1 degree of, and then uh, <coughs> the user does not need to um, intervene by either switching off the AC or changing the set point or covering himself of all that. So, that is all, all within the, the entire scope of the indoor unit. So, we have gone a little beyond the evaporator, but all this is linked to how the evaporator is going to function. <coughs> 